Hello, everyone, and I would like to welcome you all to this uh, World Food Day event uh, hosted by Demon Ford University. And today we have a lineup of speakers who will talk about different aspects of foods and their role in health and prevention of disease. So it will be quite an interesting event, and there will be a chance for asking questions and answers at the end of the event. We will have a panel discussion, and after the panel discussion, we'll have a chance to uh, receive questions from the audience, from wherever you are. Please engage and ask us questions. You can send your comments through as well, and we will do our best uh, to answer the questions as they are posed. So um, at the beginning, uh, I will make a, a short presentation, and thereafter, I will have some of my colleagues who will also make presentations describing their research and uh, how they think food is important in the context of COVID-19, as we have just sort of like coming out of uh, the pandemic and beginning to get back to what we, one may call a normal way of living. I think uh, it's important to learn some lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic with respect to food. And from my point of view, um, from my life that I've lived in this planet, I do not remember any other time where food has been such an important issue of discussion such an important issue of discussion for children, for adults, and for all societies and for all countries. Everywhere, food was a subject of discussion, either because people were fearing shortage of food, panic buying, or people were looking for finding foods that will protect them against infection, against uh, COVID-19, recovering from COVID-19, or protecting themselves against COVID-19. So food has become a very important subject, uh, not only in the lives of researchers in universities, as we are uh, here from the university, but actually food is such an important issue of discussion amongst the public. I mean, everyone is thinking about what food to eat, uh, what to avoid, and, uh, you know, the internet is full of uh, advice to people that this food is good, this food is bad, this is good for COVID-19, this is good for cancer, this is good for Alzheimer's disease, something is good today, and a few days later, some research comes out saying that actually it is not good. Then there is the fake news, fake claims about cures for COVID-19 by eating certain foods and so on. So uh, we are actually you know, uh, drowning under information. And it's very difficult sometimes to uh, discriminate between what is real, uh, really scientifically correct and what is actually just uh, some opinion of an individual. And therefore, universities and academics, as researchers, we need to uh, you know, sort of uh, do uh, much more work to explain, uh, you know, what constitutes proper thorough scientific research as opposed to poor quality work or even sometimes one's opinion and sometimes vested interest and so on. So we need to uh, consider conflict of interest as well. When someone promotes a certain food, we need to know whether this is because it has some other, uh, you know, uh, intentions behind it rather than just purely that it is good for human health. So uh, to begin with, I will make a, a short presentation and thereafter I'll pass it on to my colleagues who will discuss other aspects of, uh, of research. So to begin with, can I have the uh, slides which will actually show the presentation that, um, that, I'm, um, that I'm going to be discussing with you today? So, so the my title, the presentation of my title, uh, the, uh, Present, the title of my presentation is The Impact of COVID-19 Pandemic on Food Consumption Around the World. So this presentation will begin with the definition of food. And I've taken uh, the World Health Organization and the Food and Agriculture Organization of the uh, World Health Organization, UN, as, uh, as a source for defining what is meant by food. We all have our definitions of what food is. I don't think you know most of the public will look into this definition before they would consume the food. But uh, nevertheless, uh, you know, let's take an you know sort of uh, authoritative definition of what is food. Food is considered as nutritive material taken into an organism and which fulfills needs for maintaining maintenance, needs for maintenance of growth, work, and tissue repair. So this is taken from the WHO and FAO. And the WHO and FAO are organizations which actually provides valuable guidelines on foods and healthy diet. And uh, as this is the World Food Day, uh, I am actually uh, giving some links to their um, uh, materials, which ex uh, explains to people and provides for people information about what is a healthy diet, what sort of a diet to maintain during the COVID-19 pandemic. So this is a reliable source of information which one can look into. 
So food research at De Montfort University, and I think it's important to you know sort of mention that here at De Montfort University, there are many researchers working on foods, and I only managed to get few of them. Uh, that is not to say there aren't other people working on foods. There are many people working on foods at De Montfort University, and here is just uh, you know sort of sample of few publication. Uh, one of my colleagues, Helen, uh, Helen Coulthard, who was actually last time was in this um, uh, meeting, uh, was not able to make it this time. She's actually talking about, uh, she's doing research on um, uh, on uh, food behavior, food psychology, and so on, and uh, coping uh, and with you know different issues related to foods, health, and anxiety. And then there are other colleagues, uh, Harpreet Singh, for example, will be talking today, and uh, um, also we have. Um, Hilary Shaw, who will speak about his work on the socio-economic factors related to food and so on. And we have also uh, Kashama uh, Joshi, uh, who is actually one of my PhD students, and she's doing some very nice work on food for preventing diabetes. So we'll have some interesting lectures through the day. So let's um, start with, uh, you know, discussing about COVID-19 pandemic and food. Actually, if you look at the uh, surveys that has been done around the world, and including here in the UK, we see that the survey after survey shows that people are more interested in food, about what type of food they eat, or what the source of the food is, regarding food waste, uh, in terms of effect on the climate, effect on the environment. So humans around the world are beginning to appreciate that food is linked, not with their stomach only, but food is linked with what's going to happen in our environment, what's going to happen to our climate, what's going to happen to uh, the future generation, and so on. And also the rights of animals and the rights of plants and everything. So everyone is thinking about ethics and values with respect to food, which is a, which is a nice thing, really, because we are beginning to consider other issues beyond our stomach when we think about food. So this is a good development. And COVID-19 pandemic, I think, has uh, really helped us to understand the, the bigger issues of food and appreciation of food in some respects, because I myself had noticed when the shops became empty of foods because of panic buying, I realized how scary it is to be in a situation where you can't find flour, you cannot find you know, pasta, or you cannot find rice. So uh, you know, we, we become more understanding of food and the role food play in our lives and appreciate all that goes in producing food. Our children are becoming wiser, I hope they're seeing that food is not something that someone can just produce like that. It has to be delivered to the shop. It has to be produced by the farmers and so on. So there is a lot of dimension to food that has become apparent as a big, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. As bad as the pandemic is, there is also some, let's say, good things that have come out of it. There is nothing that is completely bad. We'll, even the worst experiences in life, we learn something from that. And so the COVID-19 pandemic, in my point of view, has given us uh, you know, a lot that we can uh, you know, learn and we can change our lives in order to make this planet a better place, not only for us, but also for the other uh, living organisms that actually live on this planet, that we need to share food, we need to share what we have with all the creatures that exist around us, plants or animals. So there is you know, a lot of uh, interest in food and there is great interest, as it says here in the next uh, sort of like paragraph, you can see that Actually, more and more people are, you know, suffering stress and anxiety because of the COVID-19 pandemic and everything else, of course, as well, you know, overuse of social media, stress or financial stress, economic stress, and so on. So all of these things are causing people a lot of anxiety, a lot of difficulties and ill health and mental health issue is becoming increasingly a, a problem across the world, across all societies. Now, what people are now beginning to do a lot more of is go away from using pills to solve their problems you know for every disease there is a pharmaceutical drug you can get and cure yourself people are thinking more and more about using food and drinks to help them manage their mood relieve their stress aid sleeping and indeed even to see if some of these foods will cure them or prevent certain diseases and so this is an area that is becoming more and more uh, prominent and i think it will gain more prominence in due course because people are uh, beginning to see research emerging now, scientific research em emerging, as you will see, for example, a lecture that will be presented by others, including Harpreet, will be presenting a lecture on elderberry and showing how this uh, uh, berry can actually help with uh, health. So uh, scientific research is coming along, and this is great news for those who want to use food as medicine. So if you look at a uh, number of publications on food since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, and this is taken from uh, 
the uh, web of science and 2020 is here up to 2020 you can see and you can see the number of publications is increasing tremendously and the number of you know if you look at the number of publications obviously increased as the number of years go by but there is a greater increase uh, since the pandemic, there is much more publications being produced in this area. And you can see that certain countries uh, of the world are producing more publications on food than others. Of course, USA and China and uh, Canada, these are the countries which are leading in publications on food. As you can see, if you look at the countries which are public publishing uh, papers on food, USA comes number one, China number two, Canada, England, Japan, Germany, Italy, Spain. Australia and France. These are the countries, and then India. Uh, these are the countries that lead on the publications on food. But if you look at food and COVID-19, the number of publications produced, obviously, the number of publications are much lower compared on food per se. But food and COVID-19, when you combine them, you find, again, of course, USA leads, followed by the People's Republic of China. And then um, England overtakes Canada. So England is in third position instead of Canada in terms of COVID-19 and food. So the UK, United Kingdom and in England, where we are based actually, is the third leading country uh, researching on food and COVID-19. So we at Demand Food University or some of our colleagues are publishing papers on COVID-19 and food. So we are uh, producing publications. There is greater interest in food. And you know, a lot of our researchers are increasing, increasingly appreciating how food is important and food-related research is on the rise. And COVID-19, actually has been a particular trigger in my point of view in getting a lot of people to see how food can play a role because of the fact that foods contain you know important nutrients and uh, micronutrients vitamins minerals and a host of other chemicals that can help uh, you know sort of uh, counter disease states so i did some analysis of data that has been published on food consumption during covid-19 and overall, it seems like in most of the studies, many of the studies that have been carried out around the world, there is an increase in consumption of food as a whole. And, you know, that could be because people are staying at home. There is more home cooking and so on. People are not going to work. I mean, even myself, when I'm, as, when I'm at university, I'm there from the morning till the evening. And then I'm maybe having some lunch and in between I'm busy working. But when you're at home, like I'm now at home, actually, I'm here but I can quickly go to my kitchen and as soon as I want to have something, I can eat something. So my food consumption becomes increased because of the availability of food around me. Someone else could be eating while I'm just doing something else and that will trigger my desire to eat and I will go and eat some more. So overall, in most countries, food consumption increased during COVID-19. Of course, certain people did not increase their food consumption because of stress, anxiety, worries, and maybe certain medical conditions led to a decrease. So there are some decreases in some cases, but overall, it seems like there is an increase in food consumption during COVID-19. And that's partly due to, as I said, because of the change in the environment that we are living in. Staying at home means being more close to food than if you are uh, in an office where you are uh, you know, with lots of other people and food is only seen maybe perhaps during lunch or tea, coffee break and so on. So if you look at uh, certain good things that has come out of this COVID-19 uh, pandemic, one of the great thing I think that has come out is that there has been a reduction in junk food and fast food consumption in many countries of the world. And one of the countries which has been leading in terms of food and COVID-19 and food research really is Italy. Italy is the leading country, I would say, uh, compare, you know, keeping in mind its size and population. Of course, America has the highest number of publications, but it is a much bigger country and, uh, compared to Italy. But Italy is one of the, you know, the top countries in research on food. And there, uh, lots of different studies from there actually notice that there is a reduction in consumption of junk foods. And partially this is because of the lockdown. People could not go and access, uh, you know, fast food, uh, you know, shops uh, and uh, takeaways and restaurants. And so this decreased because of that. And also because people were at home and increasingly eating home uh, food, uh, meals cooked at home and so on. In Greece, for example, the same. There has been a decrease. Also in the Middle East and North Africa, fast food, con fast food consumption has decreased significantly. And in Saudi Arabia and in Poland and so on. And these are just a list of some countries where actually junk food and fast food consumption decreased, which is a good thing, which is undoubtedly a good thing. And that perhaps I hope will be maintained as we come out of the pandemic, everything becomes open. And I hope we will not go to the old habit of consuming huge quantities of fast food and junk food. One of the other positive things is that vegetable consumption in some countries increased. Around the world, 
there has been an increase in vegetable consumption. This is a positive development. Italy, again, uh, shown that there is an increase in vegetable consumption. Mediterranean diet is one of the best diets in the world. Uh, Italy is a Mediterranean country, and vegetable consumption there increased. India, also a country with a huge number of vegetarians. Uh, as a matter of fact, during the COVID-19 period, there has been an increase in the consumption of fruits and vegetables, which is again a positive development. Bosnia and Herzegovina, vegetable and fruit consumption increased. Poland, there was no significant increase was observed, apart from the fact there was an increase in consumption of potatoes, which is, of course, a vegetable. So some countries, however, some countries there has been a decrease in the consumption of uh, uh, certain uh, healthy foods, foods considered healthy, like vegetables and fruits. Brazil is one of them. And in the USA as well, there has been a decrease in consumption of foods. Remember, many of these studies are limited. They are questionnaire-based studies. And with certain uh, small number of people, maybe a few hundred, some studies goes into thousands. And this data is uh, modulated and dependent on the age group. So for example, in, uh, in, in one study, they found the elderly people were more eating more healthy food than the younger people. And so there is an, and also there are socioeconomic background. People from higher socioeconomic background were eating healthier foods and people from the lower socioeconomic background were uh, consuming unhealthy foods. So there are many different issues here. One cannot just simply say that it just increased and decreased. It, uh, it also depends on who. For some it decreased, for other it did not decrease. For some, they adopted unhealthy lifestyle, including having more sugary drinks and, uh, and, and for example, snacks and salty foods and so forth. Fruit consumption increased in some countries, uh, India, Italy, Bosnia, again, Turkey, fruit consumption increased. But, but in some countries, again, it decreased. Brazil, USA, and France, there was a decrease in the consumption of fruit. So it depends on country. And within a country, there are differences between different age groups, different ethnicities, different uh, socioeconomic backgrounds. So we need to consider also there are gender, sex differences uh, in terms of consumptions of food and so on. Now, I'd like to now come to something that we are doing some research on. Myself and my colleagues are working on Nigella sativa, which is a flowering plant found in Mediterranean countries and, uh, and, and some other countries as well in Asia. And it's a plant that has become very popular during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, its seeds have become very popular. Actually, I have here some seeds of this, uh, seeds from this, um, uh, 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 from this plant, Nizela sativa plant, you can see. It's very dark, and it is the darker spice that you can find in your kitchen. So I'm from, uh, from the India subcontinent region, and if, uh, we have lots of spices. And if you look at the kitchen and see what spices are there, the most darkest spice is the Nigella sativa. And it's, uh, it's very strong, very pungent, and it's a traditional medicine used since uh, the ancient uh, Egyptians uh, during the, you know, bef uh, be before Christ and during the Christian period and then during the Islamic period and other periods. So it's a widely used uh, herb plant, and this has become very popular around the world. Lots of people through the social media, Twitter, Facebook, and others saying that they've recovered from COVID-19. However, one has to keep in mind the research on this area is still uh, inconclusive and more work needs to be done before one can say that it is a cure for COVID-19 or not. However, it's a uh, substance, it's a, it, it, this uh, Nigella sativa is packed with lots of different compounds. We've done some research on this, uh, on this, um, on this plant and its seeds, and we found uh, activity against bacteria, different types of, you know, sort of like um, antibiotic resistance bacteria also. So it's very promising and more research needs to be done. And as you can see, the number of publications on this Nigella sativa has increased tremendously during, 20, uh, you know, sort of this period, as you can see, 20, uh, 2021. So what I like to say here is that Nigella sativa is becoming more popular in terms of its uh, value as a medicinal product, and this is due to the COVID-19 pandemic, because prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, there was not so much interest. There was interest, but it was not interest in the wider scale from the public and researchers. So the number of publications shows the researchers are taking the opinions of the public much more seriously. The public are saying that they're benefiting from it, and now the researchers are saying, okay, let's see, let's do some experiments in the lab, and let's do some clinical trials to see if it works or not. So some clinical trials have been in, plain, uh, in place. For example, there is one clinical trial, uh, double blind, that is already undergoing in the USA by a pharmaceutical company. And they're actually looking at the efficacy of one of the compounds that is present in Nigella sativa for 
COVID-19, uh, you know, for treating patients uh, with COVID-19. There is also another trial that has been successfully, show, successfully shown that honey and nigella, nigella sativa seeds uh, oil is effective against COVID-19. And there is another study there. So you can, I've given the literature here, you can go and look for yourself. But this, I think, nigella sativa, in my view, became a very popular food during the COVID-19 pandemic, especially among certain communities from certain parts of the world. Now, I end with a conclusion. Uh, if you look at the number of studies that has been performed on foods around the world, and in certain countries, it's been much more dominating than others, like in England and in, in Italy and so forth, we can, see that, and, uh, we can see that there is a great interest in foods and food research. There is a lot of surveys showing that there is a great interest in food amongst the public. And so there is no doubt that COVID-19 has made food a more special thing in the lives of the humans that live in this planet, whether it, you are a general public or whether you are a researcher. Everyone is now more focused on food more than ever before. And of course, there are major organizations such as the Food and Agriculture Organization, World Health Organization. They are providing valuable information to counter all the uh, sort of fake news that sometimes comes about saying this food can cure your cancer or can cure your COVID-19. And they provide uh, valuable information, what is considered healthy food. And one of the important things that we need to uh, mention here is that although we saw, uh, saw some improvement in health during the COVID-19 period for eating healthy foods, but it also varies as a function of age, <coughs> sex, occupation, socioeconomic, and cultural backgrounds. So some people are not having a healthy diet. And we need, need to identify why. And Hilary Shaw, who is one of our speakers, will actually explain to us how, you know, you have food poverty and, you know, sort of areas where people don't have access to good quality food and so on because of economic reasons or inaccessibility to food for other reasons. However, with the exception of few countries, there has been a general decrease in fast food and junk food consumption during the lockdown, mainly due to increase in home cooking and decrease in restaurant foods because they are closed. Of course, in some countries like in the UK, unfortunately, we, in my opinion, we, uh, you know, sort of made available, uh, you know, a lot of junk food through the eat, uh, eat out to help out scheme because what that did during short period uh, was a lot of people went out and uh, actually did binge eating, eating a lot of junk food and so on. So that unfortunately had a negative impact. Whereas in most places, because of the lockdown, people had to uh, cook at home. They did not have access to fast food outlets and therefore consumption of good food increased and healthy food increased. So certain foods became very popular during the COVID-19 and Nigella sativa is one of them. But this is something that one needs to do more research on. I think we are seeing a change. We are seeing that uh, food as a subject of research is becoming more important, more popular and uh, more respected. And that is great news because food is such a complex matrix containing so many different things. And traditional medicine has been based around food. And I think it would be a great loss if we ignore the huge volume of knowledge that has been uh, passed down from generation to generation from different civilizations around the world, telling us which foods are good for certain conditions. And I think we are living through a great time. And I say to the younger researchers, I think getting into food research, uh, there is no better time to get into food research. This is a great area to work on because it has so many aspects to it, whether it is culture, history, tradition, as well as the state of the art technologies in science uh, to be applied in order to assess whether a certain food can cure cancer or not. So with this, I'd like to thank you for listening to me. And then now I will pass on the lecture to my colleague, uh, who is uh, the next speaker. And uh, it's uh, doc uh, Dr. Harpreet Singh. Dr. Harpreet Singh is uh, an associate professor at Demon Ford University. He's a good friend and colleague of mine. And today he's going to talk about elderberry. And, and that's an, uh, another food that has become actually popular during the COVID-19 pandemic. And he's going to discuss how, from his research, uh, uh, you know, at the molecular level, why this elderberry can be a, a healthy food for, uh, for human beings and potentially even for COVID-19. So without further ado, I pass it on to uh, Harpreet. Thank you, Paris. Uh, thanks for the introduction. But again, thanks for the informative talk that you, you've given us in terms of uh, how food consumption has sort of changed over the last sort of 18 months or so. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't got a bowl of elderberries, which I can show you right now, but I wish I had. Uh, but what I'm going to try to do 
today uh, or within this next 10 minutes, just try to give you a bit of a tease in terms of uh, the evidence that we're showing at the molecular level where elderberries might can be used as a medication for the treatment of vascular health. And I think to sort of note at this stage is that um, food will not replace medication vaccinations, but it will help to sort of complement and support treatment. And it's like a, a vehicle that will help to help treat, um, especially chronic diseases in the near future. So again, further research is needed in the areas of food as uh, a, a, an area to treat uh, such chronic diseases. So in terms of um, the, oh, sorry, just bear with me. Right, I'm back. Yes, uh, so in terms of berries, and there's a lot of information around the benefits of berries, and there's a lot of information in the literature. And, and berries have a, a, a compound, a rich compound, a natural compound called anthocyanins. And I think if uh, those that attended um, the session last year, I briefly gave you an introduction in terms of uh, the benefits of berries and how they might help in the treatment in COVID. Uh, so again, I'm very just going to give you an introduction in terms of where the evidence lies in terms of their, their involvement. Uh, so these anthocyanins, uh, they form a class of molecules called flavonoids and, and the dark colour, pigment colour, the red, blue and violet pigment colour that the, these berries hold is due to that uh, flavonoids. And they have very sort of protective of benefits. And as you can see, uh, I've listed a few references, uh, which recent references, which sedate that they have some antiviral protection. Uh, they've shown that they help to protect against influenza A and influenza B. Uh, there's also anti-cancer properties um, of certain berries. But also the most interesting one for me, as, a, as I'm a vascular biologist, uh, they have some cardiovascular protection effects as well. As I said, there's a lot of evidence suggesting that the different classes of berries have a protective effect. Uh, elderberries, on the other hand, there's very little in the literature in terms of their, their effect, especially on cardiovascular disease and, and vascular biology. And what I'm going to try to sort of show you today is some, some uh, data that is showing some encouraging results is showing that some key markers of cardiovascular disease uh, can be sort of um, protected by by elderberry extracts um, that we're currently researching on. So before, to give a bit of context for those who are not quite familiar with what cardiovascular disease involves, again, it's a complex process um, uh, uh, which involves uh, a mixture of process um, chemicals which lead to the blockage of, of an artery or a blood vessel. And the process is called atherosclerosis. So I'm not going to go into detail uh, of the process, but this is a nice sort of uh, picture taken from uh, a, a journal on vascular pharmacology by Nelson in 2017, which describes the process quite neatly. Uh, the main contributor to uh, endotherosclerosis uh, so is what we call endothelial dysfunction. So what endothelial dysfunction is, 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 is endothelial cells are line the inner wall of your blood vessels. And over a period of time, they lose their normal function and you tend to get tears in your in, in, in the monolayer, and that allows the invasion of um, all sorts of stuff. Uh, one though is uh, your cholesterol, especially the low uh, uh, the low density lipid proteins, which is referred to as bad cholesterol. And as they enter these tiered um, or dysfunction endothelial cells, they start recruiting macrophages, uh, their underdeveloped foam cells, which leads to developing um, plaque and which then can get ruptured and can cause cardiovascular disease. Uh, and some of the key components which are associated with endothelial dysfunction is listed on the side here, where you might get a, a reduction in the levels of uh, enzyme called uh, endothel endothelial nitric oxide synthase. So endothelial nitric oxide synthase produces nitric oxide, and nitric oxide is very important in teams of keeping your blood vessels nice and open, but also have an anti-inflammatory effect. So under endothelial dysfunction, you have a reduction in the level of these sort of chemicals of ENOS. Also, a ROS, which is the reactive oxygen species, another com component which is elevated. So we all know having active oxygen species circulating in the blood 
are, are a bad thing. And one of the key functions is that it contribute in the oxidation of the uh, low density lipoproteins, which can then uh, react and recruit macrophages and which you get these foam cells as depicted as, as yellow substances around the inner monolayer as described in this picture. Uh, other molecules like VCAM is a Dijon molecule which recruits macrophage recruitment, again, contributes to the plaque formation. And finally, inflammation as well, NF-kappa B, that contributes to increased inflammation. So these are key processes that leads to um, uh, endothelial dysfunction, but also contribute to cardiovascular disease. Uh, also in the literature, there's a lot of evidence suggesting there's certain cytokines, which also uh, increase the progression of uh, atherosclerosis, the plaque formation. And I've just listed, again, uh, an image taken from a journal, from European Heart Journal, uh, stating, especially the ones in red, there, there is TNF-alpha, which contributes quite significant for endothelial dysfunction, but atherosclerosis. So what we did was uh, we looked, we took some cells, um, endothelial cells, which we grow in the lab, and these are harvested straightly from, from humans. So they're primary cells, they're not cell lines. And we, we treated the cells with TNF to, to mimic uh, the environment of, uh, of an individual who might have uh, atherosclerosis, a, a throma being developed. And we then looked at certain markers. And the first marker we looked at, we looked at ENOS. Um, so if you, uh, and so ENOS is, again, just to remind you, is an enzyme which produces nitric oxide, and nitric oxide is, is, is important in vascular stability. And what we found is obviously, when we treat the endothelial cells with TNF, that reduces the availability of this particular protein. But when you treat the cells in the presence of elderberries at 50 micrograms per mil, that hopefully improves the levels, increases the levels of ENOS back to a more normal state. And it has a source. So, so what this suggests is obviously it's, it's, it's making the nitroxide more available under a disease condition, like uh, when, when you're exposed to TNF. Uh, another mark we looked at was ROS. So again, uh, looked at the levels of ROS being produced in, 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 in the cells. Very similar, they were treated in the presence absence of, uh, of TNF, but also uh, to some of the reactions we included the elderberries and what you saw there was again a very similar in result where those uh, cells that were treated with TNF they saw elevated levels of ROS in their cells but when you they were treated with elderberries they brought the levels quite significantly back to a more controlled level. Um, we also did some um, flow cytometry and looked at the levels of VCAM so remember the VCAM I just told you was are these adhesion molecules which recruit macrophages to the developing uh, uh, athroma uh, and which then for the least of inflammation. So these adhesion molecules, uh, if further elevated, can recruit more macrophages and can make the, uh, the, the throma develop even further. And very similarly, uh, in this case, we looked at the intensity, uh, not the expression levels, but the intensity of VCAM. And in terms of the intensity, uh, the VCAM levels would significantly increase under TNF, but when you included the elderberries, they were brought down to a more controlled level. And then finally, we looked at NF-kappa B, which is a marker of inflammation. Uh, so very similar, when we exposed the cell with TNF, NF-kappa B was elevated, uh, but the elderberries were able to rescue it back to a more controlled state. So these are just some key markers. Um, uh, they're not the ex exclusive markers. There are some key markers which contribute to cardiovascular disease and and all these markers suggest that um, uh, the elderberries in some way or another are protecting um, either bringing the levels back to a normal level or reducing them so that the cardiovascular to, to, to can adopt to a more functional working uh, blood vessel. Uh, and so what we found so far at the molecular level, so I just want to emphasize the point at the molecular level, we haven't done any human studies or any clinical studies. This is just generally looking in the, uh, in the lab culturing cells and looking at the molecular level. And what we're seeing is that um, endothelial dysfunction uh, is caused by, you know, elevated the levels of rocks, uh, reduced levels of ENOS, increased levels of NF-kappa B and increased of chem one which can contribute to cardiovascular disease. But what we're seeing at the preliminary results, we're seeing that these elderberry extracts have seemed to be rescuing or protecting the endothelial layer uh, and hopefully, you know, that will substantially prove or benefit or patients will benefit who might be suffering from cardiovascular disease or are on treatments 
for, for the reduction of cardiovascular disease. And so I just want to finally uh, leave you with a thought, really. Uh, again, this was a paper, again, it was a short review looking in terms of how it's important to integrate food and nutrition into healthcare. Uh, and I think the authors stated here that um, um, with the with the search that they did was there was only about 32 sort of key research articles which really looked at integrating food as as alternative med a source of medication for the treatment of uh, chronic disease. And um, quite interestingly, uh, I just want to also share uh, another article uh, which came to my attention where um, elderberries have been used in the treatment uh, and in prevention of the virus brutality illness. And again, this is a very similar, uh, a systemic review was conducted by, by the authors where they did a good thorough uh, literature review of about over thousands of research articles. I think they also looked at five clinical trials. And what they saw was that um, elderberries didn't um, reduce the chance of catching the, the, the viral in infection, but they, they, they did show that um, elderberries did dr dr dramatically decrease the, the duration or the severity of catching uh, all the symptoms catch caught by those individuals, so which I thought was quite interesting. So what our sort of main is in terms of going forward now is obviously to further look at a bit more molecular um, molecules which contribute to cardiovascular disease, try to understand in a bit more detail some of the mechanisms involved, uh, but also now they're moving into uh, this work into animal models and then hopefully maybe we can further move into sort of uh, patients of uh, clinical trials where we can maybe think about um, using elderberries as an alternative approach for the treatment of cardiovascular disease. So again, the key emphasis at this point, again, is uh, we're trying to see whether we can use elderberries, elderberries as a prescribed medication that be given to patients who have maybe coming from a, a bypass or a, a, or a, uh, a stent treatment which they can support their treatment and can speed up their recovery uh, and then can be back to normalise uh, and complement their treatment. So I'll just leave you that there. Uh, uh, and I just want to acknowledge, obviously these are the references, I'd just like to acknowledge the team. Uh, so again, Joseph, uh, most of the work is conducted by Joseph. He's our PhD student who's doing this work. And I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Marisol de Boit and Amir Hussein, who were quite equally contributed on, on the project. But also, the company who has provided us with the elderberry extracts. Uh, thank you for listening, and I'll pass you back to uh, Pavis. Th uh, thanks very much indeed, uh, Harpreet, uh, for your wonderful presentation. Very exciting, and uh, I think there is a great prospect in this research, and we are going to look forward to uh, you know the uh, latest findings and maybe a presentation next year with uh, even uh, uh, positive, um, even clinical trials maybe beginning. Uh, now we have the next speaker, and it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Hilary Shaw. Uh, he's a visiting research fellow in the Center for Urban Research on Austerity at Dumont Fort University, and his lecture is entitled Obesity, COVID, and Poverty, Geotracking, the Real Killers. And I think this is a fascinating presentation and really look forward to listening to it. Hi, good morning. Uh, good, good afternoon, rather, everybody. Hope you can all see me. Uh, Looking at uh, what are what are actually the connections between poverty, obesity, and COVID nineteen, and I've started off with a diagram for anyone who was here last year that what I call the vicious triangle because poverty, COVID nineteen, and obesity all reinforce each other. COVID nineteen causes economic disruption, inequality, which will ultimately cause obesity, uh, deprivation, and obesity. The comorbidities for obesity contribute to COVID nineteen, and seen obese, um, obesity can ultimately say contribute through its other diseases to both poverty because it creates economic disadvantage and COVID-19. So that was the qualitative work from last year but can we make this more quantitative and put some sort of flesh on the bones as it were and work out what the linkages between some of these factors are. So this is based on MSOA analysis of England and Wales and for those of you not acquainted with what MSOAs are. These are small neighbourhood statistical areas for England and Wales. They have them in Scotland, but they have slightly different variables. So this research just covers England and Wales. 
There are 7,200 of them across uh, England and Wales. Uh, they're quite so homogenous socio-demographically, which reduces the MORP and modifiable area unit problem to an extent. You have to look that up, won't cover that now. They're nested within local authority areas. And the best thing about them is that they cover, there's a large range of data sets, a wide range of uh, deprivation, economic demographic uh, indicators, including COVID deaths. And these can be found at NOMIS, uh, NOMIS web, the URL down there just below. So going on to what some of the statistical issues are with this analysis, um, the COVID deaths on this website are covered up to the end of April 2021, but that's okay, that's 128,000 deaths, that's about 95% of the current toll. So we've got a good picture of COVID deaths in England and Wales for this period. There is some proxy data which we have to use. For example, there aren't reliable statistics at MSOA level for, for adult obesity. So we've used child obesity, which is more accurate, but we can be fairly sure if the children in a household are obese, then the adults are likely to be as well. Uh, the MSOA population varies between 5,000 and 16,000. These change over time. So we have a sort of inverse data. The analysis works on population per COVID death, for example. So reverses the correlation signs, you'll see the, the lower the number, the more severe, the smaller the population per COVID death, the more COVID deaths we have and so on. The timing of the COVID pandemic is slightly unfortunate. It straddles the 2021 census. So some of the data goes back to 2011, but uh, we have to ask really, this should still be valid. How much has changed? Because relative deprivation doesn't change so much over even quite long periods, we can look at Booth's 1890 map going back 130 years, and we still see familiar patterns of uh, deprivation. Yes, there's been some large gentrification projects locally. We've probably heard of Battersea and the new Battersea Northern Line extension, huge gentrification project there. But largely, we can probably say that as long as all the MSOAs have moved in the same direction, we're going to get some uh, valid data off this. And actually, these older maps will next year, if you come back here, we'll facilitate deeper data comparisons between what's happening now and what has happened. And what we have here is essentially the uh, what I call the Pentagon paradox. This is nothing to do with America. These are COVID and four other factors related to COVID. The percentage black, Asian and minority ethnic in the area, the number of older people, the rurality of the area, how rural it is compared to urban areas, and deprivation, stroke obesity, these are closely related. And what I've done here is linked up with the, the green lines indicate that the factor reinforces positively, the red line indicates there's a negative correlation between these two. So for example, older age and COVID deaths, uh, older people have been more vulnerable to COVID deaths and there have been more ethnicities, uh, ethnic minorities have been more vulnerable to COVID. So percentage BAME in COVID is a green line. But older areas, areas with more older people tend to be whiter as well. So we have a sort of contradiction here in that these two factors, older age and percentage ethnicity, are working against each other when we look at the, the uh, COVID prevalence in these different 7,200 MSOAs. We have to work out, you know, is, is there greater prevalence because it's older or because it's more ethnic, ethnically minority populated? What's going on? Some of these factors are actually against each other here. And the yellow line at the side is... Um, again, rurality, rural areas are mostly more affluent than the city areas, but there are some pockets of rural deprivation in England, for example, in uh, East Anglia and, um, and the Fens. So, and that complicates matters. We'll see that in a minute. So moving on to the maps of COVID deaths. Now, these are, uh, these are based on, um, these say it's COVID deaths, oh, sorry, these are obesity. Uh, there's a prevalence of obesity and uh, the maps work on the same principle across that the pinks and reds are the most severe, the blues and greens, blues and purples are the least severe or the most affluent, and the sort of yellows and greens are in the middle. So with London, we've got this sort of familiar poverty cross, if you like, going across east-west from South Hall, uh, Acton, and through into the East End, and going north-south down the Lee Valley into Bermondsey and Croydon. Those of you familiar with London will probably conceive at the bottom there, there's a place called New Addington, which is a sort of pocket of deprivation within more affluent Croydon. And you can see sort of towards the bottom left, the affluent Kingston and Richmond area out in purple there. So purple, low obesity and uh, pink and red is high obesity in the poorer areas. 
and I've put on there as well east of England uh, which you can see again if you know the geography of England up in Lincoln East Lincolnshire and down in the fens we've got some pockets of high obesity the pinks up there around the wash and that's quite ironic because these are the areas where you have a lot of people producing the fresh food and vegetables but they're low paid it's agricultural processing jobs and they often can't afford the actual food that they're producing so we've got some sort of obese areas some pockets of rural deprivation in these areas and finally you might be able to see this on this map but right at the bottom in the uh, Basildon Tilbury area there's some deprivation extending out from East London along the Thames estuary and these maps are at the you can see a lot more of these maps for the rest of England and Wales at the URL at the top there fooddesert.org images Great Britain MSOA I'll leave that up there because there's a lot more to look at there so moving on now to uh, COVID deaths and uh, now we see a similar pattern again we've got the um, We've got the London area, we've got the low COVID deaths in the sort of affluent Richmond and Kingston area. We've got the east end of London has some areas of high COVID deaths. Further out in the north and west, we've got some COVID deaths as well. We've got more older people, perhaps more affluent, but older people. And if you look at Croydon as well, again, down at New Addington, if you know where, if you know where that is on the map bottom there, you've got, again, some quite high COVID deaths. And again, for eastern England, in the sort of deprived less affluent rural parts of uh, east of Lincolnshire and down in the Fens you've got some more areas of higher Covid deaths and looking at deprivation again we see the similar pattern again the grey and dark grey areas are actually worse than the red areas here because there was a wider spread of deprivation and again we can see the sort of familiar east west cross north south cross down London down the Lee Valley across from South Orland into the East End and uh, some deprivation as well in East, some quite serious deprivation in East Lincolnshire there, some grey areas, some pink areas there. So then we see linkages between these two uh, factors. This map, just put it on here, again, this is a work in progress. It shows the ethnicity of London. The darker areas are less white British. The greener areas are more Asian areas. The blue areas are more white non-British. That would be sort of mainly East Europeans. And the pinker Movi areas towards the east, particularly see over towards the east of London, are more the black, where are the above average number of black Caribbean population. So these maps are trying to show sort of the relative prevalence of four different racial characteristics, which I'll get back to that in a minute. That's quite interesting about that eastern pattern there, where there's more people of black Caribbean origin in the east of London. So, so these maps are presently based on the 2011 census, but um, when we get to the 2021 data, which will probably come out next year, these will use the same choropleth bands as 2011. So we'll be able to see direct comparisons, which areas have got better and which have maybe hopefully not got, maybe some of them got worse, but we'll be able to see direct comparison between these two areas. So look at that URL up there, you can see them for Wales, Southwest England and the Midlands and the North as well. So the correlation factors here, very briefly, um, these are 10 factors that are on that NOMIS site. Um, we've got obesity, age, COVID deaths, household dep deprivation, a composite index there, percentage white, uh, overcrowded households, that's more than one person per room, self-reported bad health, people with uh, degree level qualification or more, households without a car, and those on benefit claimants. The COVID correlations were quite low. The biggest correlation there was with uh, bad health. We've got a 0.126 but um, otherwise quite low. The obesity correlations are much higher as we'd expect with deprivation. Uh, we've got quite a high one there with household deprivation, 0. 0.6758. And, uh, and also bad health is about again a 0.6 there. The yellow ones are paradoxical ones. I just highlighted those boxes in yellow where we seem to have uh, co more overcrowded areas actually very slightly to do with less COVID deaths. That's not quite what we'd expect. But if we look across at those degree level uh, households, we seem to have more people with degree level education also goes with more overcrowding. And this could be younger people living in inner London, inner city accommodation where they're trading off space because of the expense of it. They're trading off space in return for uh, greater connectivity living in the inner city areas. So we have some paradoxes there with these and um, moving on to these. Now moving on to partial correlations finally. Partial correlation transects, just very briefly, it's explained more on the website. We take the correlation factor between two factors A and B for all areas, and we then take a third factor C, which could also be A or B, and we shave off the wealthiest 10% and redo the correlation, shave off another 10%, 
we're moving towards ever less affluent areas. And uh, so essentially what you end up with is a data narrative moving across from, from less affluent areas to more affluent areas, like your imaginary walking across the whole area from poor to wealthy, and seeing how the, the relationship between A and B changes as we move along this wealth scale. A worked example in uh, the British Food Journal in uh, 2012, where we found that the correlation household between overcrowding, which is the, usually a sign of deprivation, and obesity across the whole of Birmingham was actually minus 0.2. Again, we had this paradox where more overcrowding seemed to go with less obesity. Well, when we looked in high employment areas, this correlation became plus 0.5. There was a strong correlation between overcrowding and uh, and, uh, and obesity in the high employment areas. And conversely, in the high unemployment areas, it became more strongly negative at minus 0.5. So the data narrative here suggests that being unemployed in a wealthy area predisposed to obesity more, uh, probably because in those areas you're facing more costly shops like Waitrose, but in the poorer areas, being in work predisposed to obesity, probably because you're facing lower wages and also less time to use the cheap street markets. If you're unemployed in a poor area, you can get to these cheap street markets. You've got greater access to fruit and veg, but the markets are going to be closed outside of working hours quite often. Uh, looking at these data narratives again, what we'll go through these very briefly. The uh, seemed like the age slightly raised the COVID death, but this age factor worked more strongly in areas with high ethnicity populations. And moving on, we had a similar pattern here with overcrowding. Overcrowding seemed to exacerbate the COVID mortality more for ethnicity, for, for high BAME areas. And this could be perhaps we have two sorts of overcrowding here. Uh, many um, BAME households contain multiple generations in more rooms, whereas overcrowded white households may contain fewer people in fewer rooms. So obviously, if you've got more people in more rooms, but still overcrowded, you're going to be facing a greater risk of COVID transmission, perhaps. Uh, Self-reported bad health, again, we had the same pattern that this raised COVID mortality, but seemed to work more in the more higher ethnicity areas. And with degree qualifications, we actually got a very similar effect where um, it's the having a degree qualification was more protective, as it were, against COVID deaths in the ethnicity areas. Now, it seems likely from these, moving on again, we got the degree level qualifications seem to seem to reduce the COVID deaths. Moving on from this, what it seems is that the areas, the deprivation factors, that's lack of degree qualification, overcrowding, um, obesity, poverty and so on, seem to work more strongly in the ethnicity, in the areas with a higher ethnic population rather than the more white areas. So suggesting that the populate the BAME population might well be more deprived and therefore we need to tackle these deprivation factors. So conclusion, so there's a lot more on that website. Conclusion, there's this complex interaction between COVID, obesity, age, health and multiple deprivation. Uh, the vulnerability of ethnic minorities may well be due to actually deprivation effects like poorer diet, um, obesity, work, transport, accommodation. They have less access to private transport, maybe lower paid jobs. Um, a work in progress here suggests that the Black Caribbean population may be more vulnerable to COVID than the Asian population. And this, again, may go with the fact that Black Caribbean areas may well be less affluent than some Asian areas. We saw in that map of London that there are some higher than average Asian populations in more affluent parts of north, outer northwest London, for example, whereas there was a higher Black Caribbean population in the east part of London and down towards Tilbury and South End. So essentially, just brief conclusion, tackling COVID, tackling obesity, they go together, they're very important. And this is going to be perhaps a more equalization policy of looking at accommodation costs, looking at low pay, looking at uh, work conditions. And this will pay off in maybe the next pandemic, we can reduce these COVID deaths. Okay, thank you for that. Thanks very much indeed. Uh... Hillary, for your uh, wonderful presentation. I think it goes to show how complex this uh, COVID-19 uh, is in terms of uh, differences in death rate uh, as a function of uh, a, you know, ethnicity and poverty and deprivation and so on. It, it's, it's a complex web. And I think we are still uh, you know, a long way from understanding fully you know, uh, what are the issues. But clearly, poverty and deprivation is no doubt an issue. 
and it's not uh, only restricted to people from certain ethnicities that uh, you know people are dying mm -hmm. it is also like you said in lincolnshire and other areas where there is uh, you know high levels of obesity uh, uh, happening so i think we need to look at uh, the lowest denominator in our society and identify who is at risk and who needs help and going beyond ethnicity and other definitions, which sometimes uh, you know detracts us from the real issue, which is often poverty and overcrowding mm -hmm. and uh, you know uh, housing and so on. So we need to mm -hmm. look into identifying the real sources. And I think we'll discuss this uh, during the um, uh, you know sort of panel discussion session. Next, we have another speak speaker, and now we have a PhD student, uh, Kashama Joshi. Her PhD topic is on diabetes. And she's actually doing a PhD under my supervision. And today she's going to present some interesting data which relates food consumption uh, with diabetes. And I think uh, predicting um, you know, who is likely to develop diabetes on the basis of the types of food consumed and so on. So without further ado, I will pass it on to uh, Kashama for her presentation. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I can bring my uh, slides. Yeah, uh, today's presentation, uh, I'm going to focus on three main aspects, which are, uh, yeah, uh, role and relationship of food and health, why personalized uh, food is necessary, and then my study where we developed a non-invasive pre-screening tool to set personalized dietary goal at participant level for prevention and management of type 2 diabetes. Uh, let's bring up the first slide, which says that you are what you eat. This is me on the left. Uh, these various foods are part of, uh, not part of me today, but tomorrow it will be based on what choices I make resulting uh, in making me either healthy or unhealthy. Uh, food is an integral part of all of us, and we have kind of associated memories with it, right? From winning to having a family time together, socializing over uh, with friends over food, uh, uh, having different sorts of food when you are uh, under feeling under weather, uh, or when you are stressed out, uh, uh, taking a kind of a bar of chocolate and uh, uh, taking out your stress. Uh, eating habit also changes as we aged. Uh, food as medicine wisdom is not new to us. It is coming up strongly from over 2,500 years ago, where it is used at the heart of diagnosis to cure health conditions. There's a very popular uh, proverb I have put on, on the right hand side, which says uh, it is taken from Ayurveda, uh, which says that when diet is wrong, medicine is of no use. And when the diet is correct, medicine is of no need. I think this is quite profound and it again reinstalled uh, the fact that healthy food uh, is a powerful drug. Uh, and if you see on the right hand side, there's a therapeutic kind of order uh, in case of naturopathy. Even in the naturopathy, the approach is from bottom to top, where the diet and lifestyle changes are at the foundation, curing the root cause of the health condition and then going towards upwards, uh, towards more kind of intensive invasive treatments based on the intensity of the health condition we are curing. Uh, so that now uh, brings us to the point where uh, how well we know our kitchen pharmacy, our kitchen food lab. Uh, turmeric. Turmeric is a great uh, anti-inflammatory, anti-diabetic properties. Alzheimer's, it is fantastic on uh, Alzheimer's, depression, arthritis, cancer. Uh, fruit, fruit papaya, it is uh, very good in enhancing the insulin secretion. Uh, peppercorns, peppercorns are great for lowering blood pressure, anti-diabetic agent. Uh, blueberry, antioxidant, improving insulin resistance, which is the root cause of type 2 diabetes. Uh, even the yogurt, great on increasing the gut bacteria. Uh, this pomegranate on the left-hand side, great on vitamin C, antioxidant, cancer protection, uh, the, then great on anti-inflammatory properties, heart disease, flax seeds, uh, rich with omega-3 fatty acids, reducing can cancer risk, and a great source of dietary fibers, improving cholesterol, lowering blood pressure. 
So there are lots of kind of uh, goodies or tools that are available at our uh, kitchen pharmacy, uh, which we need to understand and we need to uh, know what kind of combinations we can use, uh, which will be helpful to treat uh, the illnesses at our kitchen uh, pharmacy level. Uh, even each country has got a country specific food diet plan, uh, which is if you say for UK, uh, UK also developed Eat Well Guide. But the thing is, it is at the uh, population level and it is not catering or suitable for the individuals with the health conditions. Uh, so, so, so that drives to the point where we understand that one diet won't fit for all. And that's precisely why some people get the results after following a particular diet and some uh, fail to do so. And that precisely when there are lots of kind of uh, diets available in the market, for example, Atkins diet, carbohydrate diet, Mediterranean diet, uh, vegan diet, uh, they are not uh, uh, like uh, suitable for all. There's one more kind of uh, interesting fact about uh, the food is uh, same food, if you can uh, digest, uh, still it has got different kind of responses. Uh, there's a popular study uh, uh, called as a twin study, which was conducted in uh, US. Uh, they recruited over a thousand kind of uh, participants, both from UK and US soils, and they included 240 identical twins. Uh, they were given uh, like uh, the pre-formulated uh, meals such as glucose drinks and muffins, and they observed for two weeks. Uh, in uh, some of the individuals were uh, found with the elevated kind of uh, blood sugar levels and also their fats were elevated uh, but these results were not identical or found in the other individuals even in the identical twins so this study concluded that uh, different people even the identical twins might uh, respond differently to the same food we ingest and why these differences of responses after eating the same food? Uh, if we deep dive uh, into the literature, we found out various sorts of re uh, like uh, reasons, uh, right? From meal frequency, um, like some people take two meal frequencies, or some people have uh, more than two, or some people only have one uh, meal at, uh, per day. Or timings are different. Food synergy is different. Lack of food diversity, uh, then effect of foods on the gut bacteria. Uh, the thymic effect of the food, genetics, age, sleep and exercise pattern and environment also play a role in exerting the different responses in uh, similar or in the identical twins as well. Uh, so uh, like we understand that uh, we are uh, what we eat. Food is uh, like integral part of us. Food is a powerful kind of uh, super drug and one diet plan won't fit for all. And that drives to the point where we need to get to the personalized kind of customized kind of food approach uh, to deal with the uh, kind of dietary based chronic diseases. Uh, and that's where the, my study started building it up. There are lots of dietary diseases such as obesity, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer. Uh, my study was uh, mainly focusing on type 2 diabetes area. Currently, there are lots of challenges in case of type 2 diabetes. Uh, uh, to name the few, I can say uh, only like a few newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes patients are referred to GP practices uh, to uh, have this uh, like uh, for the program like Desmond or to empower uh, with regards to the knowledge and uh, the food they can eat to prevent their condition. Uh, but because of the uh, NHS uh, tight costing, uh, not everybody is referred to that kind of programs. Uh, only specialized center has got this provision. Uh, even the uh, physicians are not trained in nutrition uh, interventions, and that could potentially act as a barrier while counseling the diabetes patients. Uh, dietary guidelines, uh, even they vary across the globe and uh, their availability uh, and the reach to the healthcare professionals as well as patient varies. Uh, currently, there is no standard uh, method or uh, method to generate a meal plan for, uh, for say, that type 2 diabetes specific uh, needs. Uh, even at the GP uh, practices, uh, uh, we found that, uh, uh, first of all, we know that diet is a kind of primary modifiable risk factor in case of type 2 diabetes. And yet there is a little or no provision at clinical settings to access and assess dietary information from, uh, from from the general population as well as from high risk individuals of type 2 diabetes or even the type 2 diabetic patient uh, to uh, get uh, to get that dietary information 
and when the modest even the modest attention could be effective not only in managing but preventing the condition so we understand that there's a gap in the like uh, at the clinical settings and we started uh, building it up with uh, with uh, devising a kind of culturally sensitive dietary questionnaire uh, where uh, uh, which is based on epic not of faq uh, the dietary questionnaire uh, encapsulated the information such as uh, uh, such as demographics, anthropometric measurements, health and lifestyle conditions, as well as uh, comprehensive dietary uh, intake. Uh, the dietary information was accessed in terms of 22 nutrients specific for uh, type 2 diabetes, which was accessed uh, from 380 foods and 14 food groups. Uh, further, these the output of 22 nutrients specific for type 2 diabetes uh, their status was accessed when uh, these outputs were compared with uh, UK government recommended dietary standards uh, to get it in terms of kind of low, high or at recommended level status. Uh, all this information uh, can be useful uh, for uh, the clinical settings to uh, develop as a briefing tool to develop or set a kind of customized approach uh, for uh, general population, even for uh, uh, like diabetes patient as well as high risk individuals to get their uh, uh, like diabetes correct or their condition if they're developing, get it right before they actually get diagnosed with it going forward. Because you know, type 2 diabetes is, uh, won't happen overnight. It takes 10 to 12 years uh, to develop that condition. And if we can control that first pin by giving this dietary approach, and diet and diabetes is a dietary uh, like disease, so we can able to help uh, to control NHS cost as well. Uh, this is the approach I have taken. Questionnaire uh, covers 380 foods and uh, 14 food groups to, to get 22 nutrients, which is specific for type 2 diabetes. Uh, so this particular study, uh, non-invasive pre-screening tool, is kind of a step towards this precision nutrition in case of type 2 diabetes. Um, so we can conclude uh, uh, this presentation by saying that uh, it is possible to set personalized food approach for not only in the management, but prevention of dietary-based chronic diseases, uh, and, and in particular type 2 diabetes in this case. This is my team who helped me to uh, develop the non-invasive dietary-based tool to access dietary information. Thank you. I'm ready for the uh, questions. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Kashama, for your uh, very nice presentation, very clear presentation showing you know okay. clearly that uh, we need to uh, bring in uh, dietary habits and food consumption into the care of patients so that we address obesity or type 2 diabetes early on and yep. uh, you clearly indicated that you know just a small introduction of this process can uh, help and the need for personalized medicine and one size does not fit all is right. an important message and i think you know all through the four uh, uh, you know, presentations, I think we really saying that, you know, it's not, we are all different. Each, every individual is different, uh, you know, from country to country, there are variation, region to region, there is variation. And uh, somehow using big data and knowledge and numbers and information that we have available now to be yeah. able to pinpoint where the need is necessary the most and so on. So I think we'll now have a um, panel discussion so you can have everyone um, together and we can have a discussion about the different presentations. And also I ask, uh, the audience who are participating in this event to send in their questions through the comments uh, channel uh, and uh, discuss with us so that we can uh, have a lively discussion about the findings presented by all the uh, uh, presenters today. So starting off with uh, Harpreet, I mean, it seems like Elderberry is uh, really promising. I mean, your work is doing well. And I guess, you know, vascular health, that is also connection with COVID-19. And, you know, you mentioned about a paper where they're say, saying that, you know, elderberry might be useful for, for COVID-19 as well. So considering heart disease and cardiovascular health has such a, a strong connection with COVID-19, I guess this is an area that is also pro probably very interesting for you to follow up as well. Yes, yeah, sure. I think there's loads of evidence suggesting those patients that are, uh, have come from cardiovascular disease, they have a high risk of constructing a virus, but their mortality rate is very high. And so uh, it, it's nice to see where uh, uh, we can see the dual benefit where elderberries might benefit the patient who has undergone some sort of a cardiovascular procedure in the treatment, but also to see where it reduces the risk of them 
uh, constructing the virus. There's a lot of evidence suggesting that um, uh, elderberries or, or berries in general might reduce the replication process of, of, a, of a viral infection. And whether that is able to do that in the COVID virus, that remains to be, to be seen. But I think currently we are looking at some preliminary data uh, where we are trying to infect uh, primary endothelial cells with the spike protein, virus protein, to see what markers are being affected and, and see whether elderberries can rescue it back. And that's something, some preliminary work which uh, we're currently conducting. Yeah. Uh, just following up on, the, on, this, uh, on this aspect, actually, I wanted to ask, do you think that, you know, we are seeing a change because of COVID-19? Because in the, in the past, pharmaceutical companies and researchers in universities you know, I'm not really doing much research on uh, fruits and berries and, um, you know, food as medicine, let's say, or components or natural products. It seems there is a proliferation of uh, interest in natural products or fruits, extracts and so on, which is a big change. Why do you think this is happening? Is it because uh, there has been so many failures in terms of, uh, you know, synthetic drugs that uh, companies have invested a huge amount of money and because of toxicity issues and other issues, they never managed to get the drug onto the marketplace, whereas with foods and extracts, you can, at the least, you can sell, uh, ex, uh, you know, sort of supplements, and therefore maybe there is greater interest, and even companies, you talk about an actual company supporting your research. So so even even here, do you think this has a, uh, you know, role that foods are safer, and so people are more willing to take a, you know, food supplement, knowing that it's food, and therefore I, I can't be harmed. Do you want to comment something about this? Yeah, I think it goes back to that awareness now. Student, uh, I mean, the public's being aware of social media, a lot of information coming to you, and they're a bit, bit, bit cautious in terms of what they are consuming. Uh, there's still quite retaliation, obviously, over the vaccine program of people. Some are still reluctant, what am I getting myself put in my body? So that's what the, yes. I think the, the mentality of, of, of the public, they're becoming a bit more aware they're avoiding chemicals or drugs, and they're trying to take an alternative approach. And the alternative approach is the natural way, you know, by food or, or other sort of supplements. But also going back to your point, I think if you look at the last sort of decade or so, apart from uh, the vaccination, COVID vaccination uh, program, there hasn't been any drug or some sort of miracle uh, uh, drug or, or vaccine that's come in the market that might have reduced the key chronic diseases like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, or cancer quite significantly. Obviously, we, we, we were going through this pandemic and obviously uh, the scientific community had to come up with a quick uh, version of, of, of the vaccine, which has been successful. But apart from that, I, I, I can't recall anything where the drug companies have come up with a drug that has really helped us to prove um, general health. But so what we're thinking now, I think what the thinking they're rather investing so much money into there i think they're now thinking about it is the time now to maybe look at the some of the, the foods uh some of the natural products which they can be used they can extract the key chemicals and maybe use that as a, as a way of therapeutic uh, medication or, or, or supplement as as as, as you uh, suggest thanks very much thank you uh, a question for uh hillary uh, I mean, very fascinating work about, you know, the relationship between poverty, deprivation, overcrowding and COVID. Uh, I just wanted to ask you a question. You know, we live in the age of big data. We have access to digit, digitize. NHS has digitized everything. Uh, GP, you know, collects our information about our, you know, ethnicity, our age, our sex, our you know health condition and everything. We have so much data. When you go to the shops and markets, they keep record of what you are buying and selling. So we have so much data about individuals, which area they live in, which postcode they live in, and what are the surrounding environment and so on. We have so much data available. Isn't it possible to do something like what uh, Kashama was saying about uh, personalized uh, you know, targeting of at the individual level so that you don't go into the more complicated and controversial issue about race, ethnicity, uh, you know, poverty, religion, and all of these things. But we look at data to identify the lowest denominator, the people who need to be vaccinated first, the person who needs to be helped and financially supported first, so that we don't, we are completely unaware about their color or about their, you know, sort of other aspects of their life. We just know from the data that this is the person who would benefit from 
uh, vaccination or this is the person who would need to be supported with good nutritional advice or diet and so on. So what we are trying to do is to save a human life mm. based on all the data that we have available to identify who is that need. Because we knew a lot of things, you know, like we know that people who live in Surrey, they live up to over 80 years old. People mm. who live in the northwest of England, like Sunderland or live in the Martha Tidfield or live in uh, some areas of Glasgow, they die at the age of 75. So, and uh, one of the questions that um, my head of school actually, Paul Illingworth raised, you know, we, you know, we've, you know, and it's, the question is there and I think you can connect the two things together. You know, he's saying that, you know, poverty and deprivation has always been a problem. We never seem to address it. Inverse care law still applies. This is his question actually and the comment. Now, you know, clearly we, we are very advanced and we have so much data available and so on. Can we go beyond these things and identify who needs help and help them and ignore things like, uh, you know, controversial things like ethnicity, color and all the and, uh, sex and all these sort of things? Can you, can you uh, address well, this question, please? I, th I think there are, it's, a, it's in theory, that'd be great. I think we have three problems, really, sort of three tiers of problems. First problem is that uh, people people's behavior is quite hard to change you know i mean people know that junk food is unhealthy but they like to eat chocolate they like to eat sort of burgers and things it's quite short term so people are short term behavior self satisfying you've got anti vaxxers we know that the vaccine is good but you know people people's behavior is very hard to change it's costly to change it then that leads on to the second problem that governments have a short term or short time horizon you know it's never more than 5 years in the uk is often less than that so governments don't want to spend on things that will take years, it will take years to turn around obesity, it takes years to change people's dietary attitudes. So these these attitudes are referred to, they're gonna take a long time and be costly to change. And the set the, the other problem is that uh, is that if if we try if we try and do that, yeah, it's sort of you know where, where does the funding come from? The third, the third problem is that if you if, you, if a government did want to put some costs into this and put some resources into changing people's behavior and long run uh, remedies for obesity then obviously that would have to come from taxes and the final problem is that we all think we're better off than we are it's been proven that you know if you ask some people particularly in the middle classes they think they're in a higher decile wealth wise than what they are and that leads on to the fact that we don't want to pay taxes to support uh, to support anti-poverty measures anti-obesity measures we think we're all okay on our own you know we all think we're more financially safe than what we really are so there's no willingness to pay taxes for these and it's hard to change the behavior so it's it's a sort of social political problem really you've got to really educate people if, if you can do that at a low cost there are there are low cost ways to educate people about diet um you know introducing maybe recipe leaflets targeting uh, uh places like um like benefits offices targeting schools targeting schools uh, getting it early on is quite important to target children's behavior but the problem again i suppose back to the second problem that you do children's behavior that takes years to show through into adulthood so it's a sort of time social and particular political problem really yes thanks very much indeed so so this this i think leads me to kashama i mean you know which is trying to do something at a small scale through our you know phd project that she's doing to try and see if this uh, personalized uh, diet and nutrition can help in type 2 diabetes. Uh, do you uh, see that this is actually going to be adopted by the NHS and the primary healthcare in the UK? Do you see this as something possible? Because we know that, um, you know, the work of uh, Roy Taylor at Newcastle University about calorie restriction and so on, and how that managed to reverse type 2 diabetes. Now, what you are suggesting through this project is, of course, uh, you know, um, bringing in this questionnaire to help people uh, to implement this do you think this is likely to be implemented is there what are the reactions from the clinicians so actually you gave the answer in your question itself when you are compared our study with the royal teller uh, direct study which is like used in the uh, gp practices all over uk uh, the i will put it in uh, like two points perhaps uh, the direct study was uh, yes it gained a lot of kind of uh, attraction in terms of losing the weight and uh, reversing uh, the first time in the even uh, in the, the guidelines the term reversing type of diabetes came in practice because of that uh, kind of study uh, but that study, what it did uh, to get that results is uh, that they put on the formulated kind of uh, uh, diet to the patients. So that is not sustaining. That is not a long term approach. It is just uh, when the people will be off from that uh, project or from the trial, they will again go back to that uh, eating habits. Perhaps uh, they shouldn't. But 
but there's a high possibility. It is not a long-term kind of approach. Uh, but whereas uh, what we are trying to do in our study is, uh, and there is a kind of uh, interest from the currently in Leicester, because we have rolled down this study in Leicester uh, population, Leicester divert ethnicity population. Uh, the leading uh, like GPs in Leicester, uh, which are uh, doing great in the diabetes kind of space, uh, they have shown the interest in uh, conducting uh, these kind of using this kind of leaflets or questionnaire in their practices and see how uh, uh, they can control or perhaps uh, educate the kind of patients and reverting their conditions. So there is can, definitely a, a palette we can see. And our uh, uh, like uh, like the questionnaire is a non-invasive. So it is easy to roll out. And it is like there's a, as you said, the technology is doing a big time uh, in sync with this questionnaire as well. So getting the results, um, generating the precision nutrition, supplying that information to the uh, like uh, doctors or healthcare is not a kind of, it is at, at a click away. So I think, and that uh, dietary collection of dietary information is currently uh, not available when diet is a modifiable risk factor in case of type 2 diabetes. So we are kind of uh, getting that uh, piece which is missing right now. Uh, so there is definitely a kind of a, um, a appetite for that. Thanks very much indeed. So I think uh, there are some comments and questions. There is another uh, comment from uh, Paul Paul Ellingworth, he's talking about um, the, the you know in terms of uh, you know people's attitude to food and so on, which is changing. Yes, uh, Paul, I mean you know you are absolutely right. Uh, the younger generation actually are uh, quite more attuned to you know sort of climate change issues, and and they are uh, you know one of those uh, group who are actually you know eating responsibly thinking more about changing their diet eating less meat and so on so so there are more consciousness uh, in our society about food what the food comes from there is increasing uh, you know sort of um, you know interest in eating local food and that that is good i mean in the sense that you reduce uh, pollution you know transporting foods from long distances and so on so there are quite a lot of interesting changes that are uh, that are going on and and that is that is you know i mean very nice in terms of um, uh, what we see for the future because you know climate change is a big issue and uh, one of the things that actually you know i mean uh, i noticed from the presentation of uh, hillary was that people in lincolnshire who are actually farming communities living in the countryside they're actually growing the crops and yet it is on those areas that you found, you know, there was higher levels of obesity and, and, and higher level of problems. And you attributed this to poverty. And you mentioned something about the, the they could not afford their, the food that they are producing. Is this, is this the real case that it is that they could not get those vegetables and greens because they are too expensive? Or is it, do you think, possibly because of poverty and so on, that people tend to, you know, have let's say have less awareness about healthy foods they don't use olive oil instead they use some other some other oil they don't have a, they don't go to the gym to exercise or they don't have uh, you know access to oily fish uh, on a regular basis to have high quantities of vitamin d and so on do you think it's, it's, it's something to do with those factors rather than not being able to buy the foods that they're producing I think I think it's a bit of all three. I, mean, I, I did a book called The Geography of Food Deserts, Food, Diet and Obesity earlier. I'll just plug that. <laughs> but there, I, there were three factors, and I called them the three A's, ability, assets and attitude. And yes. ability was, which actually relates to half region and five is one, ability was can you actually get to the shops where these things are sold? And I just say I've I found that if you go around a lot of poor areas, and these are poor, deprived rural areas and the city deprived urban areas, you simply can't get these healthy foods in the shops. If you haven't got a car, you can't get to the supermarket. There's, if you've just got the corner shop, there's no way you can actually access these foods. And then you've got... Um, a bit, then you've got ability, which is like financial ability. Can you afford them? And, uh, and you know, do you know how to cook them as well? There's, and then there's attitude, which was knowledge of, uh, do you actually know how to cook these healthy foods? So a lot of people use just eat because they're too lazy or they don't know how to cook. And uh, or, they, or they're too lazy, they haven't got the time. A lot, a lot of actually quite wealthy, busy executives eat on healthy diets because they're, they're working long hours, they haven't got time to cook. So it's, it's all three really. But I said about the poor rural areas, if you go around the villages, some of the villages in the fens, on the shops again you find that there are no you know i'm thinking of areas between say kingsland and peterborough you've got small village shops but they have a fairly small selection of healthy foods 
And, uh, and again, if you're working on a farm long hours, maybe you haven't got a car, you're reliant on the farm bus, the bus transport to get you there. You're going to find it hard to get to a shop where these things are sold. So you might be growing them, but but you're not going to actually access them in the nearest retail outlet, which might be, as you have know, food miles, you pick them, they go miles to the nearest supermarket, back to you, and you have to drive miles to get them to, to your house again, which is funny. But, um, you know, it's not very efficient, and it means you, the poorest people can't get them. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, <clears throat> I was going to ask Shama about your ethnicity, uh, you know, sensitive food, uh, food, uh, you know, sort of um, questionnaire. Uh, did you find from your research that, you know, there was a greater consumption of food that were unhealthy amongst the uh, ethnic minority groups? Because one of the points that Hillary mentioned in his presentation was that the, one of the reasons why the people from the ethnic minority groups might be more affected by COVID-19 could be, amongst many other factors, could be unhealthy diet, uh, foods that are probably not, you know, healthy. Because I mean, I really think that one of the things I think is important is that the geography that you live in, the climate that you live in, uh, you know, is you know, people who lived in the UK for thousands of years, they have developed a relationship with their environment, eating a certain type of food, certain amount of salt in their food, and certain way of cooking and so on and adjusted to the environment and the migrant communities who have come to the uk from other areas whether from south asia from africa the caribbean and so on they've come mainly from very hot sunny uh, climate with different types of food different types of history and they've also adapted through thousands of years of uh, living in that environment to find the best food to survive there and the, same, the amount of salt to use and so on so what happens is that when the ethnic groups, you know, min minority groups come from other places, they are uh, still maintaining their home diet, home meaning the <laughs> places they originated from. And they still continue to eat very spicy foods and they also co continue to use a lot of salts and other things. And we are living in a very cold climate and not really taking into consideration the environment we are living in. And I really think that sometimes, for example, uh, among the Asian communities, there is a higher consumption of salt. In hot climate, I can see why salt will be used a lot because you lose a lot of salt through sweating. But here in a climate where most of the time it's cold and many of the people from the ethnic minorities do not do vigorous physical activity either. So this means the salt does not actually get eliminated as much from the body as it would normally in a hotter climate. So do you think, do you think unhealthy diet is something that you actually saw amongst the uh, ethnic communities that may explain why they have higher incidence, incidence of type 2 diabetes or they die more from COVID-19? Uh, yes, our culturally, our uh, questionnaire was like uh, capturing the culturally uh, uh, like dietary intake uh, from 380 foods and from 14 food groups to get it to 22 specific nutrients for type 2 diabetes and their status. Uh, so if I dive into like say food patterns, uh, which uh, 14 food group, food group patterns, if I can access through 380 foods per part, uh, participant or say per ethnicity level. Uh, first of all, let me tell you that uh, the three top three ethnicities participated in our study were like uh, South Asians consisting of Indian, Pakistani and Bangladeshi, uh, then white British and then Africans. And uh, white like uh, ethnic minority group was in the majority covering more than 90 percentage of the studied population. Uh, unlike uh, unlike like other uh, studies where the white British or the Europeans were in the majority. Uh, so that's one of the strengths in our uh, study as well. Uh, we found that uh, like cereal and soil products, like uh, as you correctly said, uh, we uh, though we suppose like uh, like myself if i've come from india i don't leave my uh, like my chapatis and my uh, roti uh, like rice uh, but i also adapt to the like there's a nutrition transition i also adapt to the, the host uh, like country's diet as well and i find the kind of right balance where i wanted to eat uh, when to what uh, that kind of uh, uh, understanding needs to be there when you are in case of migrations happens uh, so in, uh, like in terms of our study, like cereal and cereal products were uh, consumed in more amounts in like uh, Indians, uh, type 2 diabetes Indians and uh, white British as well. Uh, if you take about like savory and uh, sugar, uh, that kind of food group, uh, they were actually all right in all the among three ethnicities with type 2 diabetes, but they were very high consumption uh, found in without. And uh, mind you that without type 2 diabetes could have the pre-diabetes as well sitting in them because we have not got kind of uh, pre-diabetes uh, status as well when we uh, taken the survey. 
So, uh, like mis mixed kind of uh, uh, approach or the intake has been uh, noticed uh, throughout this study, I would say. But uh, diabetes were mm, doing all right, but type 2 diabetes, non type 2 diabetes were need to be like kind of watchful uh, about what they're eating. That's what I would, I would say. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we are rapidly uh, running out of time, but I think I should take two uh, important points that have been raised. One is by uh, one of my friend and colleague, Ruta. And the other is uh, uh, actually one of my PhD students, Rahima. Um, Ruta is talking about uh, food allergy and she's working with uh, Giuliani, who also posted a question or comment about social media and, you know, discussing about food allergies through the media and how this, you know, our work, you know, and the work that others are doing could be communicated with social media. Mm -hmm. And Rahima is saying an, a question, asking a question, can, for example, supermarkets reduce uh, offers on junk foods? and so on. So these are other issues that I don't know. I mean, maybe I give this question to uh, Hillary, if you want to quickly say something about, yeah. you know, offers and junk food in shops and, uh, you know, eat out. I mean, what do you think of the eat out to help out scheme? Because that was really incentivizing people to go out and, uh, you know, binge eating, you know, mm -hmm. through the weekend for about some weeks in August. What is your opinion about all of this? I think the problem is f food is actually say too cheap in a way. Cheap food is too cheap. Uh, we don't when when you actually pay for it, you don't take account of the environmental costs, the health costs, the transport costs. There's a lot we don't see on the actual. Obviously, it's there, but uh, cheap food, cheap junk food, sugary food, fatty food is actually almost there. You know, it's very cheap. You know, you, you, when you when you can buy a burger for like a pound, it's very unhealthy, but it fills you up. And the problem is, say when you, when you eat out as well. The typical is when when you spend say thirty pounds on a meal eating out, only three pounds of that is the actual food. There's a lot of other costs as well, which go in like the premises, the staff, the insurance, the there are all sorts of things. So the problem is that it actually pays these uh, restaurants and food providers and and the fast food providers to give you more junk food to think you're getting more value for money because that's only a small part of the extra cost of it. You know, if 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 it, so, they can actually pump up the pump up thing. They'll give you extra bulky food, extra let's say sugar, fat, and salt. You think, oh, this is really great value. I'm going to come back for more. And the same with the supermarkets. You know, they, they keep you sort of wanting more of these bulk buys. You think, oh, I'm getting great value. I'm coming back. You don't take account <laughs> of the fact it's unhealthy for you and the environment. And so unless there's a sort of education. So so if it's left to the, the retailers and I mean the restaurants and the supermarkets, they're going to keep pumping us up with unhealthy food because it raises their profit margins to give us more. Ironically enough, you really have to start at the consumer end and say educate the consumer, which is a long run thing, even starting with schools to try and get a new generation of people who know what is healthy and demand healthier food rather than this rubbish food. Finally, I'll ask, uh, you know, Harpreet to say something about his elderberries. Is it going to be commercialized? Is it going to come to the market soon so that, oh. uh, you know, we can counter all the junk food? <laughs> no, no, it's very early days. I think we're still exploring them at the molecular level at the moment. Yeah. And we, yeah. again, every everything, uh, again, Joe's doing some fantastic sort of experiments in the lab. But everything he's uh, that we're testing on, it's showing a positive result. So it's encouraging. It will take some time, uh, but uh, again, food for thought. Again, next time in a supermarket, when you see a pack of blueberries, uh, anything rich in that sort of color, do do take a pack and, and enjoy the fruit. And just what about elderberries? Are they sold in the in the, in the markets? Uh, very rare. They can be quite expensive to get, though. Uh, they're, they're not that cheap. <laughs> no, no. not that cheap at all. But, but any families of berries, I think that they have that antioxidant type of protection effect. Yeah. So I do encourage them to consume it within your within your diet. But in terms of elderberries as a medication, yeah, let's see. Let's see what what, what the research holds. Sure. Really. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you, Kashama. Thank you, Hapri. Thank you, Hilary. And thank you to the audience who took part and post questions and comments. They're all very valuable. I'm sorry that we don't have uh, time left to take any more questions, but thank you all. And I hope you enjoyed it. And you know, do keep in touch and take care and maintain healthy diet as best as we can. It's not yeah. easy, but let's do the best. Yeah, yeah. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank Thanks. you. Bye-bye.